A lot of people ask me why I do these things. I don't have to. I could just be sitting on a beach dozing off in the warmth of the sun or enjoying the ease of being at home. But I needed a challenge. I needed a challenge to help overcome this cycle that I think everyone's been in of comfort and being at home. So I grabbed a friend and decided to walk across Madeira Island. Hello, my name is Ryan Schmitz, an American traveler who sometimes likes to document his trips. In this video, I'm actually going to be providing commentary over a previous video, Hiking Across Madeira Island. It's a cinematic hiking video, meaning I'm not talking in it, but you can get the visuals and get a pretty broad look at what the overall hike is. If you want actual commentary and finding out more of the details, this is the video for you. Anyway, before I get too far along, why don't we go over where is Madeira? A little over 500 kilometers off the coast of Morocco, you find the tiny archipelago of Madeira. And when I say tiny, I mean tiny. Even though it's so close to Africa, it's actually an autonomous region of Portugal. And although it's only 56 kilometers by 22 kilometers wide, it is pretty well known for producing some great wine, food, and one of the best footballers in the world, Cristiano Ronaldo. Well, what brought me here are the amazing year-round hiking trails. I don't try to overplan because I found that more often than not, plans change on a hike, but I do try to have a rough itinerary. So after scouring the internet for a good multi-day hike on Madeira, I finally discovered the Madeira Ultra Run, a 115 kilometer ultra run. The trail starts in Porto Moniz and works its way across the island, zigzagging along the way, climbing the highest peaks and ending on the beach of Machico. Somehow between my filming detours and getting lost, the 115 kilometers grew to nearly 150 kilometers over my six day trek. Now, some of you may be wondering, is this a good hike for you? It probably helps if I give you a little bit of a background about who I am and what other kind of hikes I've done. So first of all, I'm six foot seven, nearly two meters, about 210 pounds. So whatever, just a little bit less than hundred kilos. I'm in pretty decent shape. I, I tend to bike a lot. I hike a lot. I do a lot of outdoor activities. That being said, I had a major injury just about six or seven months before this hike. Such a bad injury that I now have a titanium rod in my leg and the fact that I had to actually learn how to walk again. And I was actually only off of crutches about three to four months prior. So if you want to do this hike, you know, a few months of training could probably do it if you're going straight from the couch. If you're already in decent shape, you should have no problem doing it. Now, keep in mind also my friend Dave, who came along with me, He's actually never done any long distance hikes. So 30,000 feet of elevation gain, roughly 10,000 meters over the course of, well, well, for us, 150 kilometers because we got lost a lot. Uh, he was able to do it. And uh, it doesn't mean we weren't tired. Doesn't mean we weren't exhausted, but we were able to do it. Anyway, let's get to the commentary on the trail. I'm gonna try to answer as many questions I can in regards to where we stayed, what we ate, how much the cost and expenses were. And then I'll also cover a little bit about the COVID protocol that's going on. Hopefully by the time you go, you're not gonna have to deal with this, but for right now, this is the world we live in. So I wanna make sure to give you that information. Let's go. For packing for us, we had to pack for possibly inclement weather just because we were going in November and with the altitude, it's not completely unheard of to have snow and freezes. After picking up my buddy Dave, getting to, I think it was Newark, and then we flew to Lisbon and then Funchal. We had to take this like crazy cab ride over to Porto Moniz, which is on the other side of the island where the trailhead is. We stayed at this pretty nice hotel. Um, it was still like under a hundred bucks, but it was like the nicest hotel over there. It included breakfast, but we ended up missing breakfast. Breakfast didn't start till seven. I think we left at like 6.45. They ended up packing us these picnic breakfasts. We, we just asked for it and um, it was inclusive in the price. So that was pretty nice because it saved us a few bucks. And it was like three sandwiches. It was kind of crazy how much food they gave us. Um, we could just kind of go straight up from Porto Moniz. It goes right on up this crazy road. And it was just straight up. And this is, I think this is the beginning of an ultra run. It just continued to blow my mind this entire time um, for how much work it was for us that people are actually running on this is just is mind blowing. So here you see the sun is pretty much up now. I think it's a little bit past seven, 7.15. That bell ringing was seven o'clock. Um, kind of on this pass up here, you've got a, a few more little houses and just this farmland. Uh, it was pretty and um, people are nice, but they're a little bit, I don't want to say standoffish. They just, um, they don't definitely necessarily like recognize your existence. Uh, I guess they're just kind of a little bit private, maybe a little bit leery of strangers. But every time you talk to people, they seem very, very friendly. 
So we came over this pass and this was like kind of our first real view of the hike. It was, it was really pretty. You can see these terraced farms on either side. Um, the path was, as you can see, kind of like concrete. Um, it was in pretty good shape going through this section here and uh, easy. I mean, it was an easy, easy start, but a good warm up to getting going. I think it was roughly, I don't know, a thousand feet, if that, um, to get up to this point, a thousand feet of elevation gain. And we started a quick downhill and uh, legs were definitely feeling warmed up at this point. Um, the weather was still pretty good. The first few days, the weather was a little bit iffy. Uh, this was a really cool rock structure. It was just right out in the ocean. I can't remember exactly the name of the town, um, but it's not Seychelles. It's whatever the one is right before that. Um, there's not really much in town. I believe there was a small uh, gas station coffee shop. Uh, it was open by the time we walked by, which you know, again, it was probably like 7.30, 7.45 in the morning. We were making pretty decent time because we were so fresh at that point. Um, but beautiful uh, volcanic beaches. So a lot of it is uh, black sand. And the, because of that, you get this really, really rich blue water. Um, Birds of Paradise, uh, lots of fauna. They're known for it there. Uh, this is actually really, really important. Uh, there is water absolutely freaking everywhere. Uh, I don't think we ever once wanted for water. So these spigots are kind of found throughout the towns. Oh, check this out. So look how steep the road is. You actually have stairs going up the middle of it because it's just, I mean, this whole island is just straight up and straight down. It's crazy. But anyway, back to the water. The water is just everywhere. Um, you found spigots all over the trails. Uh, again, kind of heading finally out of civilization. This was kind of our last little bit before we got out of the these farms and towns. So that was a pass on the other side over there that we, we came back down, actually on the right side of that ridge there. And then we finally got onto trail. And I can't tell you exactly how many miles or kilometers this was in, but it definitely felt good to finally get into something more, we'll just say. Um, big, huge ferns, wet, dank. Uh, I was a little bit surprised with how moist everything was. Um, you know, a lot of the pictures and videos I saw is really the Pico to Pico section, where it's just very sharp rocks. Uh, so I wasn't expecting quite to be this wet. Um, these little picnic areas were found all along the trail. And, uh, you know, they peop these people really, really enjoy, I guess, going out and having barbecues because they have these little barbecue pits everywhere. So that was actually a frequent thing that we saw everywhere. They weren't campsites, but if you were in a jam, you could definitely do it. So these are levadas. Uh, this is something that's very exclusive to uh, Madeira and they are found everywhere. A lot of the trails are actually right along these, these little water canals, which you could drink them in the irrigation canal. So as long as you got a filter, you're fine. Um, we're right now up at the top of Fanal and there is a campsite up here. When we were there, it, it was actually surprising how busy it was. We didn't quite realize what was going on because the fog was so thick but maybe 50 feet in front of me right there is actually a parking lot and a bathroom. Um, there are quite a few people walking around. You can see someone slightly in the background there. And we did have, same thing, another little barbecue area. There is actually a campsite here. Probably not a bad place to camp. Um, we just didn't put enough miles in yet, so I wasn't quite ready to go and, and, and be done. Um, I, I can't quite recall exactly how many miles it is, but it wasn't. It just wasn't enough. I mean, and maybe if you wanted to do seven or eight days to go across, it, it would have been fine, but there was just no way that was gonna happen for us. So, yeah, I mean, you can see how much moisture there is. I mean, it's just nuts. Oh, you couldn't even see the, the bark and just all the moss dripping off of everything. I mean, so cool, amazing, um, but very moist. And again, you haven't seen much drone footage. Uh, yeah, because we had like zero visibility and it was raining the entire time. It was actually a huge, I want to say a huge fiasco just because I just didn't quite have the right gear to keep everything dry. When I say dry, my electronics dry. So I had a little bit of issues later on. Um, this is going back down the other pass. This is going into Seychelles, coming down off of Fanal. And this is where we were actually going to camp the first night. Now, we didn't have any organized campsites at all. Uh, there is nothing actually... Uh, that the Madeira government has as a campsite down there. There is this glamping place down there. Um, 
that was unfortunately closed. So we worked our way down to this restaurant, supposed to close at six o'clock at night, ended up closing at 5.30. We were pretty bummed, but they sold us some sodas, yeehaw. Um, so we actually had to backtrack and we were really trying to find a good campsite. Uh, we ended up just stealth camping under a couple of these trees and somebody's like pretty much untouched farm. It looked like it had been abandoned, um, but there was nowhere else to camp. We we're actually right next to the glamping spot. Now we walked into the glamping spot and when I say glamping, they had like, you know, some tents that were like pretty nice set up canvas tents and then they had like little crappy tents too but they were uh it I, there was nobody there the tents were actually set up and the place was open but there was nobody there nowhere to check in i'm not sure if the place went out of business or if we were just there during their vacation or the the low season um but that probably would have been a nice place to stay uh this was fine i mean it, it was just it was fine there was nothing wrong with it other than the thorns it sucked but it is what it is. That is me picking the thorns out right there after getting it in my knee. It was awesome. And, you know, as soon as we got done cooking, that's actually me waiting for another rainstorm to kind of pass as my food cooks. And then we ended up just hanging out in there for, in our tents for the rest of the night. The next morning, we, we got up pretty early. We had a, not a huge day, um, but since we were stealth camping, we kind of wanted to get out of there in case anyone happened to come by. I mean, the place looked abandoned, but who really knows if it was or wasn't abandoned? Anyway, we got up pretty early, um, and uh, our goal was to kind of get down to where we were going to have dinner to make breakfast, just because they had, you know, a couple tables and um, there was some water there as well. So oh, we're hoping for good weather. As you can see, there's kind of blue skies in the morning, a couple little clouds, but ground was wet. It definitely been raining pretty much the whole night. Um, but hey, the tents, tents worked out well. Uh, I, I have a Z-Pax. Uh, I got the new Duplex XL, which is pretty awesome. And he was actually using my Free Duo, um, which is also a pretty good tent, but the XL is made for really tall people. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, it's the first time my feet were not touching or my head was not touching a wall. So again, water, I mean, just everywhere, these things, these spigots are just absolutely, or faucets, whatever you want to call them, are just everywhere. Uh, as far as food goes, pretty basic, we just oatmeal. Um, I love my honey. You can see my little bottle of honey there. I, I use these new stoves this time around. They were like these super ultralight. I don't know. I don't want to call them pieces of junk. They were fine for what they were. They're under 20 bucks uh, on Amazon. Uh, I got two of them. That way we could have a backup just in case something went wrong. But it worked out great. So you can see us looking back up the valley. We camped, you know, a little bit deeper in there. Uh, where we stealth camped and those farms go pretty back, far back. So cruising through some of these farms now deeper in the valley. Now this is Seychelle. If you go about a mile, uh, so two kilometers downhill, uh, there is actually like a, a pretty good sized town. Uh, we just weren't going to add those that extra mileage. It just wasn't worth it. But if you needed to get out, you could easily get out. So this sucked. Uh, this was just like straight up um, 5,000 feet straight up in, in one mile, just this ridge hike. And it was just brutal, just straight freaking up. Um, and then we finally get up to the top of the ridge here. And we, this is like the only break we had all day of the sun. So I threw the drone up as fast as I could, got a little shot. You can see the trail there winding down the ridge, going down there, Seychelles right down there. We camped off there to the left. Uh, and this was kind of scrubby, low, whatever these bushes are. Uh, trail was pretty well maintained. Um, you know, this was nice single track, I guess. I don't even know what you call it for hiking, but it wasn't, it wasn't fire roads. Again, you can just see the, the, the clouds just hanging in there on the mountains, just everywhere. And as soon as I took the drone down, I'm pretty sure we were in rain again. This, these little bushes is an uh, invasive species. They freaking suck. I don't even know how it's just, I mean, they're like the worst thing ever. I got caught up in them all the time. Tore up my hands, legs, they just sucked. Anyway, again, look at all this just moss. So even though we were caught in the rain, uh, it obviously, rains quite a bit and I believe it's mostly on this side of the mountain range just the way the clouds work they kind of got caught on this side and then they just shot over on the other side so this is like a little outpost well we were originally going to try to camp right here on that flat area a tree is that I bought from the a little market nice and salty and fatty delicious anyway so we were thinking about camping there there's actually a, another campsite just next to the outpost 
Um, I can't even remember the name of it right now, but it sucked. I mean, there was nothing flat. The water was freaking gross. Uh, I, I don't even know how they could call it a campsite. It was ridiculous. So we were just kind of chilling there, drying out a little bit. We were pretty exhausted from the hike. It was, you know, just so steep right there. Found all these blackberry bushes, which was awesome. Real pleasant surprise, just a way to, well, enjoy um, a little something, something sweet, especially after that salty chorizo. And anyway, it was like only like one or two in the afternoon. So I finally just said, uh, yeah, uh, let's just move on and, and see what, where we can actually stay. And I'm glad we did. This is Karamujo, also known as the snail in English. It was like this crazy old estate. It looked like it had been abandoned since the 70s, judged by the graffiti and whatnot. Uh, it was nice because it had been raining all day. We finally had at least a section of the roof that was still in place. Uh, we were able to scavenge some wood. It was all kind of soaking wet. It took a little while to get going. I mean, we smoked ourselves out right in the very beginning. But once we got it going, we were able to dry out the wood and kind of get like the system going. Uh, well, Dave actually did it. Boy Scout roots coming through for sure. Anyway, getting our... Um, so going back to these campsites, you've actually got to book them ahead of time on the government's, I guess, environmental website. Um, it was a little bit confusing because when you put it in English, it translates all the names to English. Like I say, the snail on this one when it's called Karamujo. And so it was really hard for us to figure out. So you might want to try to figure it out in Portuguese first. Uh, anyway, that's what we ended up doing because for a while there, I, I couldn't find any campsites because everything was translating over to English and I couldn't find the names over on the Portuguese website. So. Some people say, hey, I don't really need to worry about getting this. Apparently it's a 2,000 euro fine if you get caught camping without a permit and the permits are free. So probably a good idea to get them. We actually had them for both this site and the other site, the one that I said sucked. Uh, and so we ended up using it here. It was free, so I just booked both of them for the same night and there was plenty of availability or lots of spaces available. I mean, we were the only play person at, or only people at both of the places. Anyway, yeah, having the fire was super nice. You see we were drying all of our gear out because we were just absolutely soaked. Uh, that night was was kind of weird um, because we actually had these windmills right there in the clouds in the upper section there. You can't see it right now because the clouds just keep, kept moving in and out. But in that upper section there were these big, giant windmills. And through the night, the clouds would disappear and they had these like big, blood lights, big bright lights on there, you know, prevent planes or whatever from running into them. And they'd flash down on our tent, you know, which it was so bright, it woke you up. And you had this like low droning, droning noise of the windmills. And it was pretty freaking creepy. It was kind of like UFOs are gonna kind of come pick you up. Anyway, you can see we didn't leave super early in the morning. Uh, we just weren't in that big of a rush to get out of there. We, it was a short day. Uh, the mistake we made, uh, which was huge for me is we actually skipped breakfast and I'm not quite sure why we, why I agreed to it. Dave said, Alice, just do it. I don't want to clean my, my pan or pot right there. Cause there was no actual water source at that campsite. So our intention was to go down and eat some food when we get to a water source and clean our stuff out. But somehow that just didn't happen. Um, so again, that was just, you saw that little drone shot. We were going down into that town and then back up to Encomiada. Uh, we were only on the fringe of that town, so we didn't really get into like any places that had grocery stores or restaurants or, or whatever else. Um, this is a really cool section here. It was these old trail that was next to an old Levada, and it just was super mossy. You can barely even see the stuff, but all these tunnels, and you saw those walls that were just kind of covered with moss. So cool. Uh, again, this Levada is not being used anymore, so there was no water source actually there. But I mean, check it out. Just I, wow. You know, just so cool. And that curve just kept on going and, and, and yeah, tunnels and just so freaking cool. So again, one of the few opportunities I had here to throw the drone up because it was just kind of cloudy and rainy uh, a lot. But as we're dropping down, we're kind of getting lower beneath the clouds. You can see them just kind of hovering there at the top of the frame. Yeah, and you just see them just hanging on those mountaintops. And so was, if you're on the ridge, it was rough. This is cool, cool ridge. We're hiking down to that town there to the left and off to the right here, you can see the waterfall there in the in the background. And and just look how lush everything is. It's just, I don't know, I just didn't expect it going there. 
So it's pretty quick going straight down here. This was actually ha had turned into a mountain bike trail. So if you're a mountain biker, yeah, I, I was actually really surprised. I am a mountain biker and there were like mountain bike trails all over the place, zigzagging along the hiking trails, across the hiking trails. And they look like they were meticulous, really, really, really well done. So getting here into town again, um, we just kind of walked through a, a few of these little farms again, where it's almost like a sidewalk going through the farms and just beautiful. Oh, here we have like this. So there were a lot of cats there. Uh, it's actually kind of funny because Dave's like, ah, there's no, no cats. We were only seeing dogs everywhere, but we ended up running into a lot of these kind of feral cats. I mean, they're actually pretty friendly. Only vineyard we actually walked through. Kind of surprising because Madeira is supposed to be known for their vineyards. Oh, check this out. On the left-hand side there, see the hydrangeas? I mean, those are plants that we, we pay for to plant where we live. And they were just all over the woods. Wild, beautiful, colorful, really, really cool. This part sucked. It was like... I don't know, like a mile of these stairs just straight up. And I was bonking so hard from lack of food. I, I was I was struggling. This was my hardest day just because I was an idiot and didn't eat any food. So this is Brisa. The, it's kind of like their local really popular soda. It's a passion fruit soda. Kind of like Orangina where like 10% of it's actually passion fruit juice. Uh, I thought it was great. And uh, Dave was all over that stuff. I mean, he was drinking bottles of it every meal. Eating honey cake there. It looked like chocolate cake. I was really excited for it, but it was not my thing. Um, kind of dry. It, it was fine, but it just it wasn't my thing. I was expecting a piece of chocolate cake. The pizza there, not traditional, we'll say. Uh, I don't know what they were thinking, putting some of those ingredients on there. It was strange. But this is a pass going down to Incumiata, our hotel. There's actually a campsite this right up near that pass where we weren't staying. I just saw it on the map. Um, but the hotel was so, so cheap. It was under $30 and, you know, had the opportunity to have a hot shower. There's a restaurant there, like, you know, like say 30 bucks for a bed, a shower. Um, I was going to take it. And the next day was going to be a monster day. I knew it was going to be a really big day. So anything that could help us get a little bit more sleep would be great. And I had an opportunity to, to wash my clothes and you can't really appreciate just how dirty my clothes were. I mean, there was so much dirt coming out. For some reason, it just didn't pick it up too well on the camera. But, you know, quick scrub, throw it up there. I did have one change of clothes with me. I had, you know, one pair of long pants and uh, one short sleeve shirt. You can see there, I, that's all I usually carry with me. I one long sleeve, one short sleeve shirt, one long pair of pants, one sh pair of shorts. So, we're there in November. I don't know if this is normal or if it's because of COVID, but yeah, we're the only people in the restaurant. But the food was good. Hey, you know, we're on the ocean. Octopus salads seem to be like at every restaurant and I'm down with that. I love octopus. And then got me some fish soup here and I'm not quite sure what he had. Um, anything, I can get some extra calories in there. And this was the regional kebab, which was like our go-to thing everywhere. <laughs> And not really much of a description other than that just said regional kebab beef, regional kebab pork, regional kebab chicken. Um, we got the beef this time and it was delicious and super cheap. Like a meal like this, I think it was maybe 20 bucks. And that included drinks, French fries, kebabs, uh, soup, salads. Uh, it was like 20 bucks. So meals and a hotel for 50 bucks. Um, not bad and included breakfast again. We were up too early to actually appreciate or to be able to go to the breakfast buffet So instead we just asked for a picnic breakfast and that's what they gave you two sandwiches apple muffin juice Mars bar um, Not bad. I mean that was gonna be our meal later on today I mean we, we definitely I think down one sandwich. I might have had the the muffin as well But we saved a lot of it for later on this was an early morning. We we knew it was going to suck. Uh, after looking at the trail, I knew there was a, a section that had this big water pipe. So I just wanted to get it done because it was not going to be really pretty. And I knew we were going to get up on this ridge where Pico Ruivo was. And I knew the views were going to be good. So I wanted to get up there and make sure we had some daylight. 
So this is the start of the climb where the water pipe was super early in the morning. I mean, I, we were probably up an hour before sunrise, maybe more. I'm not going to lie. The water pipe freaking sucked. It was just straight up and it's, and that, that was the name of the game anywhere. So this is where we're walking up towards Pico Grande. And this was cool because we, we were actually able to go by a couple like little homesteads that were out there in the middle of nowhere. Only way to get out there, people are driving their quads, um, you know, loaded up and got their wife on the back holding the groceries and stuff. I mean, that was the only way to kind of get back to these houses in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so that kind of gives you a gauge. Oh, that's our hotel right there. So that's where we stayed looking back at it um, without clouds. So it was actually kind of nice to see. So again, these are the homesteads. And this was like a Sunday morning. It was pretty cool because they had like their church service blasting on the radio and it was just, you know, a nice touch of culture. You can see someone in the back there. They're actually, I believe, harvesting chestnuts, which is another big thing there in Madeira. So you can see the trail winding on up there. Now, if you look closely, we're there on the right hand side, just walking the two of us. Um, not, uh, not a, really the hardest trail. Uh, it was in, in really good shape. Um, so not super challenging. No, none of the trails were really a lot of work. I, I live up in the northeast part of the U.S. and all of our trails are just challenging and demanding due to the mud and roots. And these trails are, well, you can look, it's like a sidewalk for goodness sakes, it's not bad. So challenging because of elevation, but not necessarily challenging because you have to really pay attention too much where your, your footing is. So sun finally breaks out, which was awesome. And it sucks. Like right here, I was having some issues with my drone. So much moisture the previous two days. Uh, I actually had my lens continuing to fog up. It was frustrating. But I think that was a pretty cool shot. That just showed you that was a time lapse. So that wasn't in real time, obviously. Of the clouds kind of coming over the ridge there of Pico Arriero and Pico Ruvio. If I'm messing up the name, sorry. I'm doing the best I can. So down there in the bottom right, that's actually where this place is. Uh, little teeny restaurant. As soon as you come down off the of Pico Grande, this restaurant is there on your right. And this place was slamming. Uh, we probably didn't have enough time to really eat the meal that we did here, but I don't care. It was really good and it was worth it. So a regional kebab, again, this time it was chicken. Uh, it was hilarious. So look at those potatoes we got there. That was a medium potatoes and it was like 10 full size potatoes. Yeah, we left a lot. Anyway, so here's kind of looking up towards the ridges of Pico Ruivo. You can see the clouds again, just kind of hanging in there. And I just had my fingers crossed that we were going to kind of get a break. But after being down in that town, here we are. Oh, here, hey, check this out. This is, again, the, the chestnuts that are just like, I don't I mean, they're just selling them on the street everywhere. Anyway, so we took a road. It wasn't too bad. Maybe it was like a mile. And then there's looking up at Pico Riuvo. You can see the clouds broke free, which was nice. It was like the first time right there where we actually saw somebody else hiking on the trail. Um, so was this our fourth day in and we finally saw somebody. Again, the clouds broke free. You can see the trail there, really pretty views. Down there, you can see that's the town that we came up from for lunch. And see the observatory over there, that little white dot on the right hand side that's actually you can see it again there that is actually pico arrero and yeah the sun just was not on our side once it dipped behind these mountains kind of done uh, this is a i mean the views were amazing this was by far my favorite day as far as views go brutal day i mean the amount of miles we put in and just going up and down the elevation change was tough so you can see those clouds just slowly creeping over that ridge there. <laughs> and unfortunately, this is our view about an hour from where we ended up staying. Pleasant surprise for me. We actually had campsites set up for camping on the top of Pico Ruivo. And we found out that the snack bar, in fact, is a refugio. So for 15 euros a night per person, we were able to actually have a bed. There's a shower. There's, uh, you know, toilets and stuff like that. Uh, we didn't actually use the showers because I think it was cold water and it was, it was kind of rank in there. But considering we would have been staying outside and that night it got wicked cold and really windy, um, it, it, was, it was pretty nice. 
But the stars up there, yeah, absolutely fabulous. Old night, stars popping out. But super, super happy that we were actually able to stay in that refugio. So the next morning, we got up before sunrise because that's kind of a thing to do. You can see Pico Arrero in the background there. So we're on the top of Pico Ruvio. I'm sorry, Pico Ruivo. Um, we were not the only people there, even though I tried to, my best to kind of capture it that way. They, there was quite a few other people who had hiked over there. There were some people who had camped over there. You can't appreciate just how windy it was that night. I would have loved to throw the drone up, but it, it wasn't happening. There was actually somebody um, who lost a drone while I was up there. That's just how windy it was. Chowing down on some chocolate cake, so missed out on it before I got that honey cake, but they actually had fresh chocolate cake there in the morning that I bought. And now this is actually the most popular section going from Pico Ruivo to Pico Arrero. The problem was we were walking against the traffic because everyone, there's actually a parking lot over at Pico Arrero that people park there, hike over to Pico Ruivo and then, and then hike back. So I didn't really love this section. The views were great, but there were so many people and there was no trail etiquette by anybody. It kind of ruined it a little bit for me. Um, but again, the views were great. These tunnels were really, really cool. Uh, it should have been my favorite place. It, I don't know if it's normally this popular. The fact that we've had so much rain and so many clouds for so many days, I'm kind of curious to see if there's a lot of people there who just, they all got shoved into that one day that we were hiking on the ridge because of the weather. But where that white ball is there, that's actually where the parking lot is. There's like a snack bar up there, which was really nice. I mean, we had lunch there steak and egg sandwich with kind of this, I guess this local flatbread. Got Dave there with his brisa and my Coke. And uh, they did have like gelato too. It was nice to have something sweet like that. Again, looking back over Pico Ruivo that direction, just really, really pretty, dramatic. And then it, it was so bizarre this next section after being in just trees and moss, all of a sudden we got to the kind of like I don't know, grassland. Um, such a, a huge change in the terrain. Uh, it looked like they'd done a lot of logging. I don't know, maybe they had some fires and stuff like that. There were kind of a lot of farms where they were putting in new trees. But again, I mean, look at this. this how are we on the same island? Uh, it's mind boggling to me. And here we are in the middle of nowhere. Again, these barbecue pits probably could camp here. Um, yeah, if you want a wild camp, I, I mean, I don't know exactly the rules, but there there are lots of places you can just set up and, and you're good to go. One of the things I, I, I probably have not been doing as good of a job as I should is how many times we got lost, which is right there is where we got lost. We got lost so many times, and, and it's not that the trails are bad, it's just that there's so many trails. Again, look at this like picnic area with the barbecue again. Flat areas could easily camp there if you had to. Another, this actually is a campsite, um, but we skipped over it. And check out these sheep. That was actually a really tough place that we got lost again, actually, because it was like this weird field area, and, and clearly they must have like flags up when you're running. Um, it wasn't obvious. The sheep here were hiking down to Ribeiro, Ribeiro, Ribeiro Frio. Eh, whatever. Anyway, I'll write it down again. So this place was pretty nice. We had to check in at that restaurant and then it was a little house right next to it. They had like three or four private rooms with a couple communal areas. Um, so yeah, I just dropped our stuff, took a quick shower and then headed right on over for dinner and the food, and it was so good, and so cheap. Yeah, when I say cheap, it's just such a relative One, term, but two, you know, three, for three, steak and pork chops and chicken and lamb chops, I don't even know what it would cost in the US, but that whole meal was 25 bucks and, or less for the two of us. We don't drink, um, neither one of us were drinking, so I mean, that would obviously add some cost if you're having beer or wine or something like that. We're just having soda. So next morning, wicked early. Uh, it was our, our biggest day, 22 miles. So we got up at 
5 in the morning and 5.30 in the morning. Uh, we want to get done in a reasonable amount of time. We had one kind of like rummy climb right in the beginning. I believe it was two or 3,000 feet um, straight up right right as soon as we started. So there's that communal area and having our picnic breakfast because nobody else is crazy enough to be up as early as we are to get started. Beautiful pine forest here. Uh, really, really cool, very dramatic. Uh, it, the train, the variety was just so impressive on this one relatively small island. Oh, this is actually the peak at, after that 3,000 foot climb. And they were kind of walking along the ridge here for a little bit. Uh, wasn't quite tall enough to be above the tree line. Those are slowly working down to the coast, which the coast hike, part of the hike is, is really, really cool. And there's lots of coastal hikes in Madeira, but this was our only section that really went along the coast. Look, look at all the trails. I mean, there's five different trails intersecting right there. So easy to get lost. And that actually has signs. Usually they don't even have signs. You just kind of guess. You got lost so many times. Another little outpost there, but you see that flat area. If, if you had to, you're in a bind, you can camp. Look at the Levada there. There's actually two restaurants here. I don't know if it was seasonality, if it was COVID, if, if what it was, but both of them were shut down. So we ended up just grabbing some food from this little snack bar area here. I mean, honey, uh, passion fruit liquor, um, sodas, whatever, some fresh fruit. And then on, on the building up, they were selling these fresh flowers. Um, it was a little bit early. It, it is a possibility that since we were there around 10, 30, 11 in the morning, the restaurants just had not opened yet. They had a very comfortable hours, we'll say, compared to what we're used to in the U.S. These fern trees, I mean, they're 10 feet tall, 15 feet tall. First, first real look at the coast here. We actually ran into some people on that, that upper section of the trail who were trail runners. Uh, they actually went to Madeira just to go run, which I guess is no crazy than going to Madeira just to go hike. Uh, but one of the guys was one of the top 10 runners for the Madeira Ultra. And the crazy part is we hiked for, we had a moving time of nearly 60 hours and he did confirm that the world record time for the trail that took us nearly 60 hours to walk was 13 hours, which is crazy to me. Here we are on the right there. Just such a dramatic drop down on the left there. Really, really, really cool section of the trail. I'm, I'm a little bit upset that it did not last longer. It was only a few miles. There were a handful of people on it because it was pretty easily accessible from the road, and it was also pretty flat, so pretty easy to do. This is us coming up over a pass, um, and little did we know this is kind of what we're going to be seeing for the remainder of the hike. We definitely got into more population, but you can see all the tiers for the farming. I mean, it's required. It's just so deep. That's the only way you can farm on this land. Well, this dog here totally messed me up. Dave actually ended up walking down a little bit and I was shooting that dog and we got lost again. This is Machiko right there walking in the final stretch and we still had lots of time left uh, for the day, lots of daylight. But we, even though it was a, a big day, uh, it's amazing when you don't have a lot of elevation gain. How much land and you can actually cover. But yeah. Wrapped it up here in Machico. We ended up taking a cab over to a hotel and we had a couple days on our own. We had those couple days as a buffer just in case we got into some inclement weather and had to, to bail out. I hope that answered all your questions. I know the one thing I didn't answer was regarding COVID. Now the rules are constantly changing. So please, please, please do your own work on it. Now, when I went, it was required to get a negative COVID test before flying to Portugal. Now, Madeira did not require it at the time, but since it's part of Portugal and you were going through Portugal, you did have to have the negative test to get into Portugal. From Lisbon, I flew to Madeira, and at that point, you actually needed a health ministry 
voucher pass. I'm not quite sure exactly what to call it. Anyway, I'll give you a link below. You have to fill out the information and then upload your vaccination status. So you are required to be vaccinated in order to be in Madeira or you have to go into quarantine. Again, this was all when I went, which was early November of 2021. I don't know what the rules are now. Hopefully they're gone and you don't even have to deal with it. Anyway, very easy to do. I actually forgot to do it. I did it at the airport in Madeira before going through their, I guess, safety check to make sure you're vaccinated. Filled out all the information, it took five minutes and then walked on through, showed them this little green checkbox. Now, when you're in Madeira, there are plenty of places to get PCR and antigen tests. And not only that, it's actually free with that little health app. They are trying to promote tourism. They want you to come there. They want your money. And so they're going to make it as easy as possible for you to go there, spend your money and then go back home. So you actually get a voucher for a free antigen or PCR test so you can return home safely and get through, you know, the airports and everything else. But that was the rules and that was the way things were in November of 2021. Again, please do your homework and then check out the health ministry link below. I'm sure they'll be able to give you a lot more information on exactly what you do and or don't need. Now, if I didn't answer any of the questions that you had, go ahead and let me know in the comments below. I, I do a pretty good job of responding to them. I even do a better job at responding to direct messages in Instagram. So if you really want to get a fast reaction time for me, go ahead on over to Instagram and give me a direct message and I will respond really quick. I'm pretty excited about all these trips I've done. I love sharing it with people. So yeah, I'll definitely communicate with you. Anyway, I hope this video was informative and you got everything you needed to get out of it and you're gonna get out there and do more. See ya.